I want to bring on my next guest, you know, from The Daily Show. He's got some hilarious specials on Comedy Central. He's the first comedian that I ever met. Uh, uh, please welcome Roy Wood Jr. Hello, Moses. Thank you for thank you for being here, man. That's my Flula accent. That's the best I could do. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you for having me. This is crazy where we are. It's a full circle moment. When I, you're honestly the first comedian I ever met is maybe 2009. We were making online YouTube videos together, and here we are again. Oh, years shit. later. Yeah, with the homie Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking oh, hey, LA, LA. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. Ben yeah, is, LA. yeah. It's been a minute. Oh my God. Ben. I'm it's, old. Yeah. It's weird where we are, where we're kind of essentially every comic is becoming a YouTuber. Yeah. That's what I'm learning. I'm, I'm getting to that place now, ordering mics and super cool soundproofing equipment to help my career it's like oh god yeah a lot of the soundproofing stuff i'm ordering is just so like my girlfriend doesn't hear how embarrassing online stand-up is yeah there's something to it where even with the emojis coming up and people like clapping or whatever i still feel like i'm bombing i don't know how you guys do the online shows i tried a couple early in quarantine and I just knew immediately, I don't have the performance shot. It's a special talent to come through somebody's phone. Yeah. You got to bring it. And my comedy doesn't bring it physically. It's not expressive. It's just, I'm the guy sitting in the corner complaining. And if you pay attention, you might learn something. But that doesn't come through on a phone. The things that you told me back in 2009 are, are things I still carry with me today. I'm like, oh, that's well, how you do you, it. Man. I'm glad it was decent advice. I'm glad it I wasn't was. a bitter, angry soul who just told you to go get a job and go to college. Quit. I'm sorry. We don't need another white guy talking about Triscuits. No. Uh, but, but that's the thing I want to bring up is that you wrote a, an article in, in Vulture, essentially of the future of comedy. And it talked about <laughs> essentially the lowest man on the totem pole of how everyone kind of moves down a rung. You're playing arenas. You're not going to be playing comedy clubs. And anyone that was getting those yeah, the biggest down. venues will open last so the comics who play the biggest venues will play the venue the next size down essentially yeah. which forces everybody below them down a rung which cuts your money which means you need to figure out another way to make money and i think yeah i think guys are figuring out like just for perspective um what's the guy terry fader for tour, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last, I think it's Fader, plays in Vegas, has a regular residency in Vegas. He's doing like comedy clubs right now until the Vegas venues open up. So you know he's gonna sell tickets and the comedy clubs have to book the best acts because they're trying to keep their lights on. So it's nothing, I didn't say that in a way to hate on comics. I'm just saying that's how the industry is going to have to survive. No, I mean- That's what has to happen. And God bless the big wigs for coming back to the clubs for a little while to keep the clubs open. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a good thing. No, I think 100%. I mean, if anything, it prepared me because I am exactly the person you're talking about where I'm the lowest man on the totem pole where you're, you're just headlining, you're just starting to fill rooms and then everything has completely come true. Everything that you wrote down in the article. And this is, this is really early March when people are like, this will probably be over in May. It's all coming true now. So I wonder, what do you see now? So now that was, what, four or five months ago. Do you see any, is there any future tallies you have now? Here's the thing, like everybody thinks about comedy as this, these big name acts coming through, but like, honestly, the average comedy club, 30 weeks out of the year, it's road dogs that are helping keep the lights on. It's the Tuesday through Thursday shows. Those are the shows that help keep the club profitable um on the weekends or whatever yeah i think that those guys i think you have to start creating your own stages you have to start because here's what, here's what i think you got a bunch of restaurants that are fucked because they can't get as many people in as they want or people are scared so you got to have something to attract them so it might be a symbiotic relationship you know the thing is just the the, the bigger issue right now what i didn't feel like i accounted for was the massive amount of unemployment Yes. As entertainers, we are a disposable income activity. So even if the clubs are opening back up, how many people have 20 to $30 to spend? And that's not counting all the people surviving. Like everybody counts COVID in deaths, but the people who survive, bitch, they got medical bills out the ass. Right. How many people are going to be able to go out and just have a night out 
Like on a, a date night at a comedy club, that's an eighty dollars spin. Twenty in tickets, twenty in drinks is forty a head. As someone who hates this and has a very vested interest, it is a waste of money to be in a club, especially when there's so many great Netflix specials, there's people on Twitch, there's people on YouTube doing the same thing or something higher quality that you could stay home. So why go out and spend money on two drinks, a whole plate of food, risk your life, then the and then the odd chance that the comedian is good. Do you think that, so Chris Rock had a quote years ago where he said that everything that I do is to bring people to my live show. Mm -hmm. Anything he did within his portfolio was to sell a 70 or a whatever his ticket cost is to get someone to see him live. Do you think it's the flip now where if you do the live show for free, you do the live show at a cheaper rate, you do it in a park or a drive in or whatever wacky place the next year holds for us at 30% capacity? Do you think the live show is the new conduit to drive people online where you can monetize through advertisements via your podcast, yeah. if you have a web series or whatever the fuck else you're doing. I, I honestly I feel like- I think you're like looking ahead, lot, yes. I do think, yes, that is, but I think a lot of comedians have not understood that yet. I think a lot of them are very bullish. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of people within our craft that are very dismissive of technology. They're very dismissive of the evolution of how people consume information. And at yeah. the end of the day, you can be the purest. Of, I stand on the stage, I'm old school. Okay, but you gotta go wherever people are and how people are taking in stuff. I honestly think that Chappelle has changed how the hour special will be constructed. If you look at the turn time from shoot, like the average hour special is probably shot eight months before it airs, yeah. right? And that window is getting shorter and shorter because public attention spans are shorter than the news cycle changes. You write a joke in April that's not even relevant in fucking August by the time it airs. Yeah. Like Yvonne Orji, I think had a, she shot her HBO special in February and I think it aired Mother's Day. So that's maybe three months from shoot to air. That's an incredibly short runway. And then Chappelle did 836, which I would argue two months total working on some of that material, but so much of it was about George Floyd and so close to it, a month, maybe three weeks from conception to air. So does that mean that the special so, gets less special when people are not putting 10 years of work into a special? Like I was just about to take my special right before the shutdown. That's like 10 years of work. So now you're thinking, are you looking at just a comic that's been on the road for six months? That's the special comes out immediately. I think you have to tap into right now, people are more connected to emotions than laughs. Mm -hmm. And I think Chappelle's shit worked because he touched people's emotions. And so I don't think it makes the special any less special. It just has to be more in the moment. And right now our moments change faster than they did under the previous comedy construction timeline the assembly line has to be shorter now so you can still have an hour special but if you had a special i give you a perfect example so i was like 40 percent. i had about 40 percent of my next hour done when COVID hit with okay the, with the plan of taping in november so around march i had about 20 25 minutes that i went this is good this is for sure we'll work there's probably four or five minutes of that material that I would even want to spew now because just tonally, you no, know, like I had a whole thing about congressional hearings and how bullshit the concept of a congressional hearing. Nobody wants to hear about that. Good luck getting anyone to care about any of that stuff. But in January, yeah, that was the thing, and it was always the thing, and it happened. For, like I had, it's crazy to think that I have jokes about mass shootings and the whole concept of how and where they occur and how the coverage is, how the media covers mass shootings. That even that is, eh. Yeah. Do you even want to talk about that right now? Because even when a mass shooting happens, it doesn't even get the coverage that it got pre-COVID because there's just something more ominous. And then you don't know who the fuck is going to win in November, which is also going to change the tone of the country. So uh, you do a lot of political humor. How do you feel about that? Do you, do you feel about doing another four years of essentially Trump jokes? I mean, with The Daily Show, it's all encouraged. It's what you cover. So where do you feel like that is? If, if Trump wins again, do you have it in you to just be like, what else could you make fun of? 
I don't know if you can make fun of it anymore because it just keeps getting more and more serious. It's like the vice just keeps getting tighter and tighter and tighter. I think the last time I righteously laughed at Trump was when he looked at the silver eclipse. Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, that was the last one. Time he looks into the sun. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like like the day after that, he's like, "All right, get them kids in the cages." So I was like, "Ah." Yeah. I don't, I don't know, man. Uh, I know that at the end of the day, it's my job as a correspondent to put a face to the people that are struggling mm -hmm. and dealing with a lot of BS in the country and find a joke in that. So I'll have to keep doing that. But, you know, you take a deep breath and do your job. I, I would prefer that that's not the situation come yeah. Wednesday morning in November, but, you know, we'll see. Are there things that, that maybe comics should be doing? So obviously investing in themselves, there's things they should not be doing. Have you seen things of like, oof, don't go live every day. No one needs to hear your thoughts. I wouldn't say don't go live every day, but if you're gonna go live every day, create an archive. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why people go on IG live every day and you don't say these shits. Like, you, like if I don't watch it live, like you have the audacity to promote yourself as live appointment viewing with no option for me to binge it later when all we are as a society habitually is a binge consumption audience now. Yeah. What do you think you're the fucking, you think you're the 11 o'clock news where if I just miss you, I miss you? No. You're doing a chair with a laptop. You're spitting funny stuff, but save it so that people can find it later or chop it down the snippets. I, I just think that you're you're in a space now where everybody's equal nobody's better than you i've seen some of the greatest comics on earth with some of the shittiest framing and lighting in their zoom chats oh yeah so you could easily create create the content that you want to be hired to make like just start doing that and if you don't know how find somebody else that's hungry team up like this is the this is the time to do that man yeah, to invest yourself and you said team up, get as close to other people as possible so that you're pushing. Try to get in there. You have to be able to create on a regular basis and have, you know, some level of an agenda and specificity. All this broad, like when you talk to Ron in a second, Ron Funches has probably done it better than most, man. Yeah. Ron, cause cause Ron is not trying to let's talk about everything. No, bitch, I like wrestling. Yeah. Let's discuss it. And I think specificity is the new broad. So find out, figure out what it is you're passionate about. And I think if you lock in on that type of stuff and, you know, then I think you're in a space where you find something that speaks to a very specific group of people. And then that's how you build your audience, man. So that when the streets open back up again and there is a cure and we're having sex with no condoms and yeah. you don't have to bang donkey style anymore to reduce the spread. Donkey style. It'll be good times. Yeah, well, you know, that's what they said. You're supposed to have sex doggy style during COVID. Oh, so you don't face each other. But at that point, yeah. it seems like some other transactions, if you're doing it right, if it's not a crime, you've been face to face at some point. I think at this point during COVID, I think we should all agree that the glory hole was ahead of the curve. Ahead of the curve. I'm not sure if this is the type of podcast <laughs> to have that discussion, but yeah, I think it's a fair observation at this point. Yes, it's very safe. It's it's very consenting. There's a hole. It seems like the person on the other end has the most control to really fight anything off because you don't have these <laughs> limbs. Because limbs attack. I think a lot of these comedians wouldn't get in trouble if they didn't have limbs. I would do a comedy bubble though. We'll go to Orlando for that. There's no way. No There's audience no way I would do a comedy bubble. I, you know what? I would only do a comedy bubble with comedians that are either married or have children. Uh huh. So not me. Yeah. You know. When I and I'm serious. Like when I look at the the when I look at the lineups of comedians that are doing outdoor shows in New York on the rooftops and in the parks, most of them 35 and under, no kids. Total like they're in a totally different set of responsibilities, a totally different set of people that they have to answer to. So you can be young and wild. Yeah. I'm 41 and I got two people living in this house that I got to answer to, you know, right. I'm not going to leave her to raise him alone. So not yeah. in exchange for working out a school shooting joke <laughs> that you both know isn't going to be relevant anymore. Not in a week. So, no, yeah. it is. Something's wrong with my life where I'm free to go yell at people in a park. Um, that's really all it is. It's not like a show. You're just on the same level and you're ruining it, someone's day in the park. You know who's fun to watch do outdoor shows? 
is uh, Mark Norman. Oh Mark yeah. Mark Norman. Mark Norman, if you go on his YouTube channel, he's probably got about eight or nine different shows he's done over the course of the quarantine. He did one on the sidewalk to passersby. He did a drive-in. He did a club. In the rain. He did one in the rain. He did the park. Yeah. Mike went out. So, yeah, everybody was in their car. No, he, he couldn't even hear the laughs. It was just people flashing lights. Like, he's probably done every possible discipline yeah. of outdoor show. But Mark is also a wordsmith. He's an addict. Like, he really is like Seinfeld in that regard. Like, he really is doing it for the love of the craft. Yeah. I don't even know if it's for the people watching. I think it's really just for him. But I couldn't do that. I, I would love to, but... No, I mean, you, you got a whole life. Yeah, the only other thing that I am starting to scale back now, um, I'm not going to deactivate it, but I think I'm going to leave Twitter for a while. Okay. Well, I follow a lot of these people for the sake of being in tune with what the streets are saying about a lot of relevant issues. Mm -hmm. But when you consume bad news every day, and then you consume people's outrage about the bad news. It's starting. It's starting to fuck with me a little. Is that maybe advice and, that comics should take, and that don't take the Twitter world? Who you know, you go on stage. A lot of people don't even know the person that got canceled that day. That maybe just for your own psyche to be a human being in this time, and not just be like, oh yeah, since I can't be on stage, I'll just tweet. 24 seven. I mean, if it works for you, everybody's got a different joke machine. You know, Twitter used to be a good place for me to run premises. Yeah. But the more delicate the topic, the more nuanced the conversation and Twitter is not a place for nuance. So, you know, if I really want to explore what people think about a, a topic before I write a joke on it, I'll take it to Facebook because you get deeper answers and you get more counter it can turn into a yeah. cluster just of arguing but it's people making great points in more longer form to help influence my analysis of the topic but i tweet here and there i don't tweet a lot about politics because if i got something funny to say about politics i'm gonna pitch that on the show and either i'm gonna say it or trevor's gonna say it so yeah. i'm not gonna burn those jokes on twitter so why am I here? What am I doing? And I mean, Instagram is cool here and there, but that's even worse because it's an algorithm. So now I'm seeing the same 40 people. It's an algorithm and it's super sad now. And they're like, what are you posting about? No one's vacationing. So it's very hard to find an excuse to post a photo of your butt because it's not like a beautiful background. It's like, oh, there's your blinds again. Which goes back to my point about how specificity is the new broad because everybody is talking about the news of the day yeah but do you have something deeper that connects with people on a deeper level that old andre 3000 let's talk about time traveling rhyme javelin something mind unraveling like that where the deeper conversations happening and they're not happening on twitter man. So, no that's great advice i mean thank you for going over that with us specificity yeah. it's the new broad find your own audience so you just got to find something you're passionate about man all right man well thank you brother i'm gonna go check on my child and make okay sure he hasn't you got a real life burn something thank you so much yeah. daily show it's back you have great specials out yeah father figure and no one loves you there wherever you go to bootleg content it's there i'm not gonna find it yeah okay find it you do the work google my name roy wood jr everyone thank you